All right, welcome back. My name is Mr. Holm. I work for Franklin McKinley School Districts, and today I'm going to be covering a seventh grade text called Gilray's Flower Pot by J.M. Barry. J.M. Barry was a Scottish novelist and playwright who lived from 1860 to 1937. He's most notable for his created character that you all know as Peter Pan. In this story, he will be discussing procrastination, which is the action of delaying or postponing something and trying to justify his actions of procrastination as he doesn't water his friend James Gilroy's chrysanthemum, uh, a flower. Today, I'm going to be reading for you Gilroy's flower pot and also we'll be uh, annotating and discussing the text as we read. If you'd like to follow along, um, I highly suggest you grab several different colored highlighters and a writing utensil. Also, note that this text gets cut off. Um, actually, yeah, this text in your packet gets cut off uh, right here, but I will provide a link to the full text in the video description below. And also, if you want, you can just uh, Google Gilray's Flower Pot uh, PDF, and it will be one of the first search results on Google. You'll get the full text that way. So if you are going to annotate on a PDF, all you have to do is open up the PDF, uh, download it, save it, and then open it up on your desktop. And up here, we have the various um, highlighting tools you can see here. I'm going to say that the author uh, or the narrator, I should say, is a man. However, I don't think it specifically suggests one gender or the other. The reason why I think this is that it just seems like, to me, um, a woman would probably uh, be more proactive and water a plant, whereas a man might let this slip to the wayside. Also, as this story was probably written in the late 1800s, um, it probably wasn't very common for women to be smoking pipes at the time, whereas the narrator suggests several times throughout the text that he indeed smokes pipes, has a study, and discusses uh, important ideas with other great minds of his time. <clears throat> and to me, uh, the late 1800s was still somewhat of a sexist society, and so I can infer that perhaps the narrator was a man. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to read the text aloud and then in response to the text after I finish reading it, I'm going to go back through and kind of analyze it and point out some important features that may not have been noticed upon the first read through. Um, a professor of mine in college told me that in order to fully understand a text, you need to read it in three times. The first time being just for uh, just to understand the scope, to enjoy the text itself. The second time to annotate it and point out important features. And then the third time to fully comprehend and understand the text. So this is Gilray's Flower Pot by J.M. Barry. The directions say read the short story and answer the questions that follow. Refer to the text to check your answers when appropriate. I charge Gilroy's unreasonableness to his ignoble passions for cigarettes, and the story of his flower pot has therefore an obvious moral. The want of dignity he displayed about the flower pot on his return to London would have made anyone sorry for him. I had my own work to look after and really could not be tending his chrysanthemum all day. After he came back, however, there was no reasoning with him, and I admit that I never did water his plant, though always intending to do so. The great mistake was in not leaving the flower pot in charge of William John. No doubt I readily promised to attend to it, but Gilray deceived me by speaking as if the watering of the plant was the merest pastime. He had to leave London for a short provincial tour, and, as I see now, took advantage of my good nature. As Gilray had owned his flower pot for several months, during which time I take him at his word, he had watered it daily, he must have known he was misleading me. He said that you got into the way of watering a flower pot regularly just as you wind up your watch. And that certainly is not the case. I always wind up my watch and I never watered the flower pot. Of course, if I had been living in Gilray's rooms with the thing always before my eyes, I might have done so. I proposed to take it into my chambers at the time, but he would not hear of that. Why? How Gilray came by this chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum I do not inquire, but whether... In the circumstances, he should not have made a clean breast of it to me is another matter. Undoubtedly, 
it was an unusual thing to put a man to the trouble of watering a chrysanthemum daily without giving him its history. My own belief has always been that he got it in exchange for a pair of boots and his old dressing gown. He hints that it was a present, but as one knows him well, I may say that he is the last person a lady would be likely to give a chrysanthemum to. Besides, if he was so proud of the plant, he should have stayed at home and watered it himself. He says that I never meant to water it, which is not only a mistake, but unkind. My plan was to run downstairs immediately after dinner every evening and give it a thorough watering. One thing or another, however, came in the way. I often remember about the chrysanthemum while I was in the office, but even Gilray could hardly have expected me to ask leave of absence merely to run home and water his plant. He must draw the line somewhere, even in a government office. When I reached home, I was tired, inclined to take things easily, and not at all in proper condition for watering flower pots. Then visitors would drop in. I put it to any sensible man or woman. Could I have been expected to give up my friends for the sake of a uh, chrysanthemum? Again, it was my custom of the evening, if not disturbed, to retire with my pipe into my cane chair and there pass the hours communing with great minds or, when the mood was on me, trifling with a novel. Often, when I was in the middle of a chapter, Gilroy's flower pot stood up before my eyes, crying for water. He did not believe this, but it is the solemn truth. At those moments, it was touch and go, whether I watered his chrysanthemum or not. Where I lost myself was not in hurrying to his rooms at once with a tumbler. I said to myself that I would go when I had finished my pipe, but by that time the flower pot had escaped my memory. This may have been weakness. All I know is that I should have saved myself much annoyance if I had risen and watered the chrysanthemum there and then. But would it not have been rather hard on me to have had to forsake my books for the sake of Gilray's flowers and flower pots and plants and things? What right has a man to go and make a garden of his chambers? All the three weeks he was away, Gilray kept pestering me with letters about his chrysanthemum. He seemed to have no faith in me, a detestable thing in a man who calls himself your friend. I'd promised to water his flower pot, and between friends a promise is surely sufficient. It is not so, however, when Gilroy is one of them. I soon hated the sight of my name in his handwriting. It was not as if he had said outright that he wrote entirely to know whether I was watering his plant. His references to it were introduced with all the appearance of afterthoughts. Often they took the form of postscripts. By the way, are you watering my chrysanthemum? Or the chrysanthemum ought to be a beauty by this time. Or you must be quite an adept now at watering plants. Gilray declares now that in answer to one of these ingenious epistles, I wrote to him saying that I had just been watering his chrysanthemum. My belief is that I did no such thing, or if I did, I meant to water it as soon as I had finished my letter. He had never been able to bring this home to me, he says, because he burned my correspondence. As if a businessman would destroy such a letter. It was yet more annoying when Gilray took two postcards to hear the postman's knock and then discover when you are expecting an important communication that it is only a postcard about a flower pot. That is really too bad. And then I consider that some of the postcards bordered upon insult. One of them said, what about chrysanthemum? Reply at once. This was just like Gilray's overbearing way, but I answered politely. And so far as I knew truthfully, chrysanthemum, all right. Knowing that there was no explaining things to Gilray, I redoubled my exertions to water his flower pot as the day for his return drew near. Once indeed, when I rang for water, I could not for the life of me remember what I had wanted it for when it was brought. Had I had any forethought, I should have left the tumbler stand just as it was to show it to Gilray on his return, but unfortunately William John had misunderstood what I wanted the water for and put a decanter down beside it. Another time, I was actually on the stair pushing to Gilray's door when I met the housekeeper and, stopping to talk to her, lost my opportunity again. To show how honestly anxious I was to fulfill my promise, I need only add that I was several times awakened in the watches of the night by a haunting consciousness that I had forgotten to water Gilray's flower pot. 
On these occasions, I spared no trouble to remember again in the morning. I reached out of the bed to a chair and turned it upside down so that the sight of it when I rose might remind me that I had something to do. With the same object, I crossed the tongs and poker on the floor. Gilray maintains that instead of playing fool's tricks like these, fool's tricks, I should have got up and gone at once to his rooms with my water bottle. What? And disturb my neighbors? How rude! Besides, could I reasonably be expected to risk catching my death of cold for the sake of a wretched chrysanthemum? One reads of men doing such things for young ladies who seek lilies in dangerous ponds of Edelweiss on overhanging cliffs, but Gilroy was not my sweetheart, nor, I feel certain, any other person's. I come now to the day prior to Gilray's return. I had just reached the office when I remembered about the chrysanthemum. It was my last chance. If I watered it once, I should be in a position to state that, whatever condition it might be in, I had certainly been watering it. I jumped into a hansom, told the cabbie to drive to the inn, and twenty minutes afterward had one hand on Gilray's door while the other held the largest water can in the house. Opening the door, I rushed in. The can nearly fell out of my hand. There was no flower pot. I rang the bell. Mr. Gilroy's chrysanthemum, I cried. What do you think, William John said. He coolly told me that the plant was dead and had been flung out days ago. I went to the theater that night to keep myself from thinking. All next day, I contrived to remain out of Gilray's sight. When we met, he was stiff and polite. He did not say a word about the chrysanthemum for a week. And then it all came out with a rush. I let him talk, with the servants flinging out flower pots faster than I could water them. What more could I have done? A coolness between us was inevitable. This I regretted, but my mind was made up on one point. I would never do Gilray a favor again.